Good morning and afternoon. As I said before, my name is Leora wolf Persan. I'm going to ask my co-presenter, colleague, mentor, and friend, Greg Peters, to show his face so that you can see who the two of us are at the beginning. Hi to everyone across the country. We're incredibly excited and, uh, and pretty overwhelmed with the, the regional representation <laughs> that's on this call. So we're really holding space for our, a national call right now. So we wanted to start today by grounding ourselves in, in why we're in this conversation. We are here to talk about identifying and transforming educational inequities. And I, I really want to concentrate on those first two verbs, identify and transform. And our essential question that we call into the work today is what might we need to know and do to interrupt implicit bias and microaggressions in an educational setting? I want to pause because we are coming to this conversation with the intention to bring the concept of school climate and culture as it intersects with implicit bias and microaggressions uh, so that we can really work towards creating an educational context, not only for our students as their student learning outcomes are equitably achieved, but also for those of us working in systems and in teams and in school settings and how we can relate to each other, um, which we know impacts the young people that we serve. So this webinar is part of a two-part conversation. So today we're in part one, and we're going to be focusing on really grounding ourselves in the language and the context of why we're in this conversation. So what school climate is, what implicit bias and microaggressions are, um, and how that relates to our work. We're then gonna move into an introduction of a framework for transformation and really focus on transformational leadership that guides us through this really hard and important work to do some of that awareness and interruption. And Greg will be introducing us into his framework that he's been catalyzing throughout the country. And we'll close. Part two in a couple of weeks is going to be focused on the next two stages of his framework. So it's going to be a continued conversation. Today, as I said, we're in part one of the conversation. We're moving into awareness so that we can get to interruption of both the implicit biases that all of us hold that really charge the way that we already come listening to conversations with our colleagues, to policies, practices that we implement and lead, and to, most importantly, the work that we do with the young people that we serve. And we're going to be uh, introducing two tools that Greg will be offering us that are really hard, <laughs> hard practices to integrate that do the radical interruption of some of the barriers to us getting to the work that we need to do. So to ground us, when we were thinking about why this conversation, and, and again, I, I just want to call out that there's obviously a resonance to the words microaggressions and implicit bias in education around the country based on how many of you have said yes to joining this morning. And part of that yes to joining is that this idea that in the past couple decades in our, in our education context, we've been really focused on the product, on the outcome, on the action, and on the doing, right? We've been asked from that and for that of each other. Right now, we're in this really incredibly cultural shift moment across the country of not just holding on to academic outcomes, but to talk about some of the more wobbly things that undergird how we arrive at our work. So the Parker Palmer quote that we, that we call in today is, and I'm going to read this in case some of you are just in audio, is if we want to grow as teachers, we must do something alien to academic culture. We must talk to each other about our inner lives, risky stuff in a profession that fears the personal and seeks safety in the technical, the distant, and the abstract. So today we're going to be talking about our inner lives, sometimes in a, in a risky way, actually always in a risky way, so that we then get to the technical in a way that is equitable for ourselves and our students. So we're going to move through part of today's objectives. So in order to reach that risky space so that we can get into more of the wobbly, wobbly stuff to speak to our technical outcomes, our objectives of today are to deepen our understanding on what implicit bias and microaggressions are and how they relate to school climate and culture. And then to begin to engage in inquiry individually and collectively about role bias and microaggressions. And so how does that play in, in our lives? How does that play in the skin that we're in across all the different hats that we hold on to as a colleague, as a staff member, as a student, as an administrator, et cetera. So I'm gonna pass the torch to Greg to ground us in launching the conversation. Thank you, Liara. 
Greetings all. Thank you so, uh, so much for joining us. I thought we would start by doing a little bit of reflection about what brings us here, what brings us to this conversation in the skin that we are in. I think uh, too infrequently we ask the question of why did we choose to commit, not just to go into, we are going into education, but why did we choose to commit to education? And when we ask that question, I think we have our passions and our reasons, but I think it's also important for us to know our history. Thought I'd start with a um, piece of history uh, that comes from the historical timeline of public education. In 1779, Thomas Jefferson proposes a two-track education system with different tracks, in his words, for the laboring and the learned. Scholarship would allow a very few of the laboring class to advance, Jefferson says, by raking a few geniuses from the rubbish. This is a very important quote to me because it makes me think about what, not just why did I choose education, but what is the system I have committed to going into for my, for my career, for a life choice. So it's important for us to know that regardless of our reasons, that just from the design of public education, historically, the very design of public education is intended to serve some better and some um, worse than others. And that's important because we go into this field believing that we're here to serve all equally, and yet when we think about the design and we study the design, it becomes evident why we are actually getting the very results that the system was designed uh, to, to get. It's also important for us to be asking the question of, again, why did we choose a, uh, or, and why did we choose to stay in this profession? And so many of us espouse this commitment to equitable outcomes for every single student, regardless of our demographic predictors. and we are in a system that continues to perpetuate inequities based on demographic predictors. So right up front, we've chosen a career that puts us in a situation of conflict. And finally, it's important for us to ask personally, what were our formative experiences in the skin that we are in that informs our work, informs our decision to come to this work and how we show up for this work every single day and therefore the results, the related results of our work. These, these formative experiences include those for us as students, as educators, and as leaders. I thought I'd take a moment just to share a little bit about what brings me in the skin I'm in as a white man to this work uh, for educational equity. So first of all, as a student, I was a student who went to uh, the premier high school of my city. And yet when I got there, I realized that I was a small fish in a big pond, but I also wasn't the same kind of fish. My family uh, w was working poor. We, um, we were not of the, the culture or the community of folks that really sent their children to, these, uh, to this school. And so when it came time for me in the 11th grade to seek out my counselor and talk about college, she, she had no time for me. And at one point when I finally got her attention, she literally said to me, Greg, I don't have time for you. Your family cannot afford college. From that point on, my whole being as a student shifted. In the next year, I cut 80 days and nobody knew. I would show up for the tests, I would ace the tests, but nobody knew. I never got a phone call home, nobody ever did an intervention or checked in with me. All that mattered was I was showing up and I was fine on their grade books. That experience I took with me to my, cho my choice to become an educator. That experience I took with me every single day to my practice as an educator, and I still take with me every single day. Sometimes how it influences my decisions is unconscious. Sometimes it's very conscious, depending on the level of work that I, that I want to do with myself about myself. As a teacher, when I first moved to California and became a math teacher, I remember I was the newbie in the department. And my department sat with me and they said, you're the new guy, you get the throwaway kids. And I thought to myself, who are the throwaway kids? How is that even a term? And I sat with the principal who very embarrassingly, you know, expressed her concern for that phrase as well. And so I just said, well, can we, can we reframe that? Instead of it being the throwaway kids, can it be the throwaway class? Can I throw away the books? Can I throw away the curriculum? And from there, we created a partnership to really rethink what class and what education, what, what the studies would look like for these students to an incredibly positive uh, result. 
And then finally, when I became a leader, one of the first things that I learned as a leader, as a white principal, was that even though my, my role was to be the leader, one of the most important responsibilities for me as an ally activist, as a leader, was I had to be in touch with my humility. Because when I sat with the families of the students that we struggled most to reach, we struggled most to serve, these families, they already had uh, information, they had expertise around the work that needed to happen. And so what I learned as a leader was to be a partner in this work and not to do for, but to do with. All of these were formative experiences that bring me to the work of who I am today and what I do today. So my question to each of you, and I hope that you'll take some time to reflect on this if you've not already, but what brings you to this conversation and what brings you to this work in the skin that you are in? With that little bit of reflection, I thought we would do an opening exercise so that we could just bring our skin into the game and think about this work. The slide that you have before you, the image you have before you, and I apologize for the folks that are on the phone calls, you, you obviously cannot see this, but the image you have in front of you was uh, drawn by an elementary school student. And this student, was, you know, her task was to draw, draw her picture of school, her understanding of school. And you'll notice there are two prompts that we want for you to guide uh, that we want you to guide your feedback with in the chat box. The first prompt is, what do you think? And the second prompt is, what do you feel? And those are two very different prompts. There's two things that are important about this visual for me um, and this, act, this exercise. The first one is, this is an elementary school student. And regardless of our interpretation of this, it is showing that we have an incredibly um, effective way of educating our subtext. Uh, as you know, as early as elementary school. The other piece is that the reason we wanted to ask the question about how do you feel or what do you feel, these formative experiences that we have, as well as the emotions we have about what is happening, they actually have an impact on the actions that we take. And we want to create conditions where we can access those emotions and be able to um, bring our full self and our most thoughtful self to this work. So that was one of the reasons that I thought it was important for us to start with this uh, exercise. Thanks, Greg. So part of what comes up in that image and, and what came up in our chat conversations um, is that that schoolhouse <laughs> that our young people were coming into and our young people were leaving uh, is the schoolhouse that all of us participate in, that we carry out, that we work in, and that we embody. Uh, and so when we talk about school climate or school culture, we want to just take a moment to think about what that experience, the environment, and the ecosystem is in that, in that box of a school, and as well understand that all of what we come into the school and all of what we leave the school is also embodied in how we experience our, our education and our narrative and how we make meaning of ourselves in the world. So when, we're gonna take a moment to pause and, and do a little bit of double clicking into what school climate and culture is. So school climate and culture, you're, you're gonna, we often sometimes use them interchangeably in, in the research field, practice field, school climate generally talks about or refers to the perceptions or subjective experiences of school. Um, and so that is a lot of what we were interpreting or reading into that young person's uh, illustration of their subjective experience of school, right? How, what school climate might have felt to that young person. Where school climate tends to talk about the actual or quote unquote objective state of the school. And, and there are many of us, maybe that's a whole other conversation of if schooling can ever truly be measured as objective because there are so many influen influential and variable factors. We wanted to ground ourselves in that difference. And so when we look about school climate and culture, I know many of us have used this iceberg analogy in our own in our own teaching and practice, but we really tend to think of school climate and culture as the combination of both the over the surface, both what we see uh, as the iceberg, right, the programs, interventions, services, and curricula that are rooted in the under the surface, the beliefs and norms and values that are often not named or assumed um, or not called in to be as seen as connecting to what we see as over the surface. And so these experiences are all transmitted. The under the surface is transmitted into the behavior and the language. Um, and how we provide supports is directly connected to how each one of us individually comes to work, 
right? How we enter our own schoolhouse and what we're expecting the product to be when we leave the schoolhouse, both for ourselves and for our students. And so we want to hold both of this, particularly because we're, as Parker Palmer was call, calling us in that opening quote, we are very, um, it is so much easier and so much more comfortable to often um, concentrate only on the programs, on the intervention services, on the curricula, on the what or on the how, but not necessarily as exciting, easy, comfortable to concentrate on the why and the who, the beliefs and norms and values. And so part of what Greg and I are welcoming you into considering today is to expand our definition of school climate and culture to not only think about the over the surface, but also the under the surface and the connections between the two. So part of that is that when we think about if we actually suss out, if we massage that iceberg a little bit more, part of what we think about is that the under really does influence the over. So if we think about under the surface, um, actually, let's start with over the surface first, because that might be some of the, the pieces that we're more familiar with, right? So over the surface, as I mentioned, those are the programs, interventions, services, curriculum. Um, and and this, this can kind of sound like what our discourse uh, probably feels familiar to folks, right? Trauma-informed, PBIS, we're going to do restorative practices. Um, and I, I really want to welcome folks to put in the chat box some of the over the surface, uh, how that resonates with how you are feeling in your work around what are the over the surface factors that are often um, part of the conversation and part of the work all the time. Right. There are many of folks on this line. I was, I was um, seeing some of the roles that you carry into this conversation. There are some of you who are in charge of LCAP. There are some of you who are in charge of implementing um, programs and services. And so you're really familiar with the what. Right. Another over the surface is the behavior. So behavior is the outer layer of feeling that then speaks to the under layer of need. And oftentimes we are really um, overly, overly concentrated and only talking about the behavior. This is pretty evident in the way that we talk about discipline, um, in the way that we measure teacher, um, teacher performance, right? It's on the doing without thinking about the why. And that's part of the exciting shift as we see nationwide in, in really adopting a trauma-informed and brain science-based lens to education. I'm, I'm doing some intersection here because we're understanding that actually only concentrating on the why doesn't, um, doesn't actually do any interruption. So some of those behaviors, and we're going to talk about micro macroaggressions in, in briefly, um, is where we see those, those uh, manifestations come out. We're going to talk about dominant discourse later on in the webinar. What we refer to dominant discourse is, is the, um, the way in which we all talk, <laughs> both, uh, both implicitly, explicitly, that comes out in our design of curriculum, that comes out in our design of policy, that comes out in the faculty lounge, um, that is the kind of assumed language, the, the kind of language of like, well, we always talk about that. This is how we do things here. Um, and the dominant discourse is assuming that the way that we do things or the way that things are, are the way that they need to be. Um, and so part of, Greg will go into dominant discourse later, what we want to hold is that programs, behaviors, the dominant discourse, all of those three um, major components of school climate culture, the way that we experience school and education, are fueled in, in, and really influenced by what's going on under the surface. So our beliefs, our unchecked norms and values, right? our dominant culture, what is, what, how are we arriving at our expectation of what that schoolhouse is supposed to look like, supposed to do, supposed to be? My, my expectation of myself as an educator, or as, in Greg's case, as, a, as principal, as school leader, as thought leader, and really influenced by the thoughts and feelings in the past history of both ourselves, um, both in what we are conscious of, and also what we carry unconsciously. And that is really connected to our understanding of bias. So we hold all of this because we're here in the conversation. Uh, Greg and I are assuming, and I, I think we we hold to be true that all of us are, are committing to this time and this conversation this morning because we have, a, we have a commitment and a vision, the ultimate goal for whole, healthy, vibrant school environments, climate and culture, not just for our young people, but also for ourselves as employees, right? And so to do that, we wanna take time to suss out, um, again, not just the over, but the under. 
So let's get into a little bit of that. Um, we're going to take some time to talk about implicit bias, which is coming up um, particularly a lot in the context of the disproportionality and discipline. Right? So we, at this point, have an enormous amount of uh, research that demonstrates that policies that might appear to be neutral on their face, at the, face, at the surface value, um, actually result in actuality in a disproportionate experience, particularly across the country, for uh, students who identify as black young men in suspensions, expulsions, and referrals. Right? Um, I, uh, often think about one of a students that one a student that I used to work with many years ago when we had done this what I thought was a beautiful uh, lesson on empowerment and on voice and really as a school we really wanted to partner with young people or so we said we wanted to partner with young people to have their student voice elevated and uh, two periods later I'm walking down the hall during my during my prep period and she comes storming down the hallway, uh, one of my students from the earlier period comes storming down the hallway, and I said, I asked her what was going on. She was clearly upset, and she said, Miss, I was just doing what you told me to do to be resilient, and the teacher told me that I was being defiant, and now I'm being sent to the principal's office. And so we think about the way that we're um, asking students to rise, to be resilient, to um, kind of all these values, but when it comes to our own practices, it can often result in um, how other teachers or how our school systems are set to read that type of behavior like defiance. So this um, Kirwan Institute for Race and Ethnicity, which is the source of, uh, of um, a lot of the work that we're going to be introducing today is, is out of Ohio. They're a really key institute for um, research on bias on race, ethnicity, and education. And these five pieces, disproportionality and discipline, disproportionality in special education, educator mindsets and beliefs, tracking and dominant discourse, these five are the key five ways in which our implicit bias shows up strongly in how it impacts uh, how it impacts schools and education. And so we want to concentrate on um, on one main today that we'll hear about later, the dominant discourse. So the ways of thinking and talking about students and families that diminish, underestimate, or even pathologize them, right? So thinking about them, uh, it's sometimes called the pobrecito effect or referring to students and families as deficit-based. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, that's, a, that's an over, uh, that's an over the surface way of how implicit bias shows up in our behavior. And Greg will be talking more about that later. But we also want to hold that that educator mindset and belief um, is something that we're asking for folks on the call, ourselves as facilitators as well, to constantly be working and checking, um, even in this conversation around um, what, how are we arriving at our expectations for ourselves and the students that we serve. So just to be very clear before we move forward, that what Greg and I are introducing is that that last component, dominant discourse, we see that as fundamental in interrupting the disproportionalities in special education, the disproportionalities in discipline, the tracking behaviors. Um, we see the last piece as, as one of the main interrupters. So we wanna just take a moment, we did just talk about implicit bias that under the surface, and now we're gonna go over the surface and do some conversation around how does what, how, does, how do our unchecked beliefs and norms and values influence our behavior um, in a harmful, um, often violent way to those that we uh, actually are trying to come to with, with good intent. So microaggressions um, are defined by some of the leading researchers and, and um, scholars on this subject as brief and commonplace, verbal, behavioral, or environmental indignities, whether intentional or unintentional, that communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative slights and insults to people of marginalized groups. So we bolded whether intentional or unintentional, because we assume that we all come into this work with good intention, and at the same time, as we are introducing, we also want to hold that intention does not always equal impact. I can come into a conversation with Greg with full good intention and actually do potentially some harm in some of the ways that I'm either talking or sharing or thinking. Um, and we in 
our educational, in order to create healthy school climates, we actually want to create a way that Greg could then call me in and hold me accountable, not just for uh, intention, but also for the impact of how what I did and said landed with him as a colleague. The other piece that I want to highlight are, are two other pieces. One is the environmental indignities. So we're not only just talking about individual behavior, we're also talking about systems, cultures, and ecosystems. Um, and we're gonna be thinking about that as we move forward. Uh, and then the last piece is this idea towards people of marginalized groups. This calls us to do uh, some further deep work around understanding how the larger issues of historical, social, disenfranchisement and violence in our country's history, and we can actually probably call in global history, impact the way that we arrive at schools and education now. So we're having a, we're having a, um, a pretty direct entry point talking about implicit bias and microaggressions, but this is contextualized and locked into a much larger conversation for us to do some deep work about how we understand um, marginalize, what it means to be marginalized, who is marginalized, and by whom and why. What is the outcome of that marginalization? One piece that, uh, and Greg will, I, I hope that Greg feels comfortable with me introducing this, but a teaching that Greg offers that I just find so profound is, is this conversation around implicit for whom, right? Implicit bias, implicit for whom? and microaggressions, micro for whom, they might be micro uh, on the account of the perpetrator, but they generally do not feel micro uh, on the account of the receiver. So we just wanna hold that we're using this term microaggression, but actually that, that term in itself may not serve us to understand the true power of that impact. It's important, I really appreciate you, you bringing up this idea of what is the micro and microaggressions. Micro does not mean it's a small act or a, it's, a, it's a small impact. Micro is simply um, referring to the fact that the way that this aggression comes out is to some extent because of the norms of our society mm -hmm. invisible or could mm -hmm. be diminished by some as it wasn't a big deal. And so it's really important to, I really appreciate you surfacing the difference between the intent versus the impact or, uh, or what it looks like versus the impact. Uh, microaggressions in, in no way are felt in a micro way. That's not what it's saying. It's suggesting that um, in the norms of our society, we might minimize it or try to make it invisible or less, uh, or, or less um, important. And that's part of the impact of microaggressions is that those on the other side of the microaggressions are further stressed by mm -hmm. the responsibility of saying, am I crazy? Did that just happen? Mm -hmm. Versus mm -hmm. it just being understood that, um, you know, I, I put in the, the quotes, I literally heard this just yesterday, uh, but microaggressions are frequently referred to as or equated with death by a thousand paper cuts. Right, yes, thank you. Right, so part of one of the, in, in another workshop that we were doing recently on this work, a participant surfaced that um, as an administrator, Right. They ask their students for who even as a as a practice, they often ask their students for signatures from a mother and father. Right. And recently a student said, well, actually, I don't have a mother and father. I have a mother and a mother. And this school continued to ask mother to continue to ask the student mother and father, mother and father for permission slips for other pieces for parent conferences, even though the student had surfaced that they come from a mother-mother family. And so there's an example that as our bias, A, our bias in this case for this educator was the assumption that all families come in one shape and that shape being heteronormative, that there's a mother and father. So that was the bias. The issue is that it continued to manifest in the school's behavior, that the school didn't stop how that bias was translating into that student. And the, one of the key words in this quote is indignity that ultimately the death by a thousand paper cuts is the small, not in the feeling, but in how we um, as a culture value these indignities, ultimately create experiences of dehumanization, right? And so part of why we're in this conversation is because we all, as you were saying in the chat box when you were looking at that image, it's painful to see our young people see schools as dehumanizing. It's not only painful for them, it's painful for us to be seen as perpetrators and participants in it. So this conversation is offering us 
the opportunity and window to do some some breath, to do some pause so that we can figure out how we can interrupt uh, that translation of bias into behavior, into microaggressions um, right now. So just to, to do a little bit more, um, a little bit more reflection in microaggressions, and then um, we're going to, we're going to shift from the, the kind of like, whoo, the what, all of this, this conversation into some of the how. So um, we want to hold that there are three different ways that microaggressions surface. There are micro assaults, which are seen as conscious. We have experienced national micro assaults in, uh, in the last couple of weeks that we know that there are ways in which um, there are explicit identity-based um, attacks on character, on attacks on our colleagues and on our civilians and our students. Um, and those are purposeful. So micro assaults are conscious, they're purposeful, um, and, and um, exist not only one-on-one -on -one interpersonally, but also in our environment and in our larger culture, right? The second type is a micro invalidation and you know it's termed as unconscious but we can often invalidate pretty consciously <laughs> so these are actions that exclude or negate or nullify feelings and and you heard um, or the experiential reality and someone put in the chat box this idea that oftentimes when folks from a marginalized group, folks of color, folks who identify as non-heteronormative, speak up about an experience. Um, right now, there's, they might experience someone saying, like, oh man, it's too much energy to be PC, or that, that's not true, like that didn't actually happen, as Greg was saying, right? And so even these nullifying, the nullifying or negating someone's experience um, who comes from a different group is part, that is a microaggression in itself. It's a micro invalidation. Um, and we might do it unconsciously, but that has very, very, that has um, incredible impact in how a person experiences feeling whole and human um, at work uh, and, and obviously outside of work as well. And the last, the last type of microaggression is this micro insult, which is also called unconscious. This idea um, that behaviors or actions um, or verbal remarks convey rudeness and sensitivity or demean that person's social group identity or heritage. This piece is one for us to do some big reflection on because uh, we may not know if we do not ask if our policies and practices are demeaning, right? And so part of the question comes in are what are some of our school's assumed ways of doing and being that might, we thought might be celebratory? We might think that having a Cinco de Mayo um, or a taco day on May 5th is uh, celebrating heritage, but actually might feel pretty um, insulting to some of our colleagues, um, especially if it doesn't really understand the, the true history of where Cinco de Mayo came in, came from. And so part of what we wanna do is really do some of that unpacking, that checking of what does it mean if we demean our colleagues and our students' social identity or heritage. And at this point, I wanna be very direct that at this point, we have, um, we have enough understanding of how our identity, heritage, heritage, and feeling of safety, we talk about student safety so much, and this is student safety. It's not just if there are guns at school, it's not just if there are drugs on campus, it's not just um, the amount of school resource officers, it is also our behaviors and actions and verbal remarks that either invite every single student equitably and equally to feel humanized or do not. That is also part of student safety. And so with that, that really calls us into a task of pretty rigorous leadership. And so we're gonna shift into talking about how we interrupt those beliefs, practices, and experiences that are harming us. Like just to be very direct, like we are experiencing an enormous amount of harm in our school cultures and systems not only our students are experiencing harm, our staff, but also how we have arrived and created um, some of the cultures of our school districts and systems. There are many of us on the line that know that there are young people who are ending their own lives. We have colleagues who are ending their own lives. There's an enormous rise in not only direct violence, but emotional violence at schools. And I just, I wanna put that, put that context that right now we are at a time in our country where if we do not start to interrupt 
um, our experience of harm and unsafety and violence will only grow. And so there are those of us on the, con uh, we are on the, in this conversation because we are saying we're done enough. And so that's our task as transformational leaders. And I'm going to pass it to Greg so that he can um, introduce us into taking, taking a, a, a way of holding this conversation true into our practice. One of the things I appreciate about that question in that slide is it talks about the importance of uh, interrupting uh, some of the beliefs, practices, and experiences that are harming others. And it's listed under this title of transformational leadership. And I think the one thing, even as I read that, is that we have to actually, when you say that, especially in the time we're experiencing right now, if we don't take the time to interrupt, and I think we need to unpack the word interrupt, and it really mm -hmm. is about interrupting and transforming. Mm -hmm because um, I frequently joke with people that I've been learning how to interrupt since I was born as a, <laughs> as a white man. And quite frankly, in my family, we're, we're, pretty, um, we're pretty good at it. Um, but that's not about transformation. And so the importance, as we move on to the next slide, of, of what we're seeking is not just the interruption, not just the stopping, but actually the transformation. Because what we know to be true is that a lot of the inequities experienced by our students and families and communities, they're experiencing these inequities that are perpetuated by educators who, going back to those beginning slides, went into this work to do good. At times when I need to look in the mirror most at where I'm, where I'm least effective, it's usually when I'm doing my best or doing what I believe is my best. So if all anybody does is to interrupt me, I'm going to get a pause. And I'm going, to do, I'm going to do a little thinking, but then I'm going to go back to doing my best, which was what was happening before. And so we need something, we, we need some attention, not just on the interruption, but also on the transformation. Uh, for those on the phone, uh, the, we have a quote in front of us from Carl Jung. It says, if there is anything that we wish to change in the child, we should first examine it and see whether it is not something that could be better, better be changed in ourselves. What I really appreciate about this quote is it's a reminder that we are not, and that we somehow, our profession and the conditions of our profession have us doing so much external work, so much looking out the window work, that we don't have the capacity, we don't have the systems to keep us looking in the mirror as well. And so I really appreciate this. And if we go on to the next slide, his quote really does inform or lead to a pretty commonly held understanding that the work we need to do in as educators, the work we need to do for transformation is, and I, and I don't know if this term is new for folks, it's been around for a while, but it's inside out work. We have to start internally because we're not just learning a curriculum that we're going to facilitate. We're not just figuring out which order of you know, uh, papers and we want to have students write. We're talking about changing the way things are. We're talking about transformation. And when we're talking about transformation, it's hard to lead others to transformation when we have not and are not continuously experiencing it ourselves. And so at its simplest, when we're thinking about the theory of transformation, it simply says that in order to really be agents of transformation, we have to first be engaged in our own personal transformation. Only by looking in the mirror and transforming our own schema, our own way of looking at the world, our own biases, will we institutionalize, uh, sustain professional transformation. And then when we are in the place where our professional work has been transformed and it is uh, uh, sustained and it is systemic about how we uh, see ourselves and how we are seen and experienced as professionals, then, then we are in a position to have what is considered transferred transformation. Transformation not only for our students and their experiences and their results, but even we're transferring the impact of transformation and we're, we're supporting our peers and other adults and professionals to be in a cycle of transformation uh, themselves. As I mentioned, this is not new work. But when I began, uh, when I left my principalship and was asked to, uh, to, to start the nonprofit that I'm at, what was missing for me was we, we were clear that transformation was needed. There was not a lot of body of work. There was not a large body of work out there about what that meant. There was a, a good amount of work of what um, tr tr uh, transformational teaching looked like. In other words, how to create trans uh, tr transformational experiences for students. But that did not talk about what was necessary for us to be in our own constant cycle of transformation as educators, because frequently, as Leora was talking 
uh, about this, our own biases, our own histories frequently get in the way of ourselves and our, our, our own espoused um, goals or our own espoused desires as educators. And so um, I was fortunate that we were able to do some work and study around this notion of transformation. And in the next slide, and for those on the phone, this is in the handouts. And I'm also keeping track of other resources that I'm, I know we want to send as a follow-up to this based on some of the great stuff coming up in the chat box. But the, you should have this slide in front of you um, if you're on the phone. It's the transformational, the conceptual framework for transformation. Now, the good news is transformation happens. It's called evolution, and it doesn't happen nearly quickly enough for the students that we're going to face tomorrow. And so we wanted to study those teachers that were both identified by their students as well as by their results as being impactful and really impact what was going on for them, that they were both able to work in a system that perpetuated injustices and work against that system at the same time. And what, what, result, uh, what came as a result of that work and that study was this framework. And I want to say that this framework talks about the stages of work or the stages that an individual or a community needs to go to. And then the work of us as leaders and the work of our institutions is to create the conditions for this work to happen. And, and, it's, and, and this is not a one and done. The, we're trying to create conditions for people to be in constant and continuous cycles of doing their own work and doing their collective work towards transformation. And so I will quickly walk through this. I think it's important if you look at the visual to recognize there are two stars um, on two of the stages. That's the focus of this webinar. The next webinar, we will focus on the other two. But right now, I'm just going to quickly go through uh, what that framework is. There is a text that was you have access to uh, about bridging the gap that includes a, a, a deeper overview of this framework. So if you're interested, I'll push you to that text. Uh, but when we're talking about creating conditions for transformation, we need to, if we look at the bottom box first, this is where we need to create opportunities and conditions and support ourselves and each other to um, understand our stance and our schema, our, our way of looking at the world. And so we need to create conditions that allow us to be able to look in the mirror and be able to say, who we are in the skin we're in, what our history is, how our history shows up with us, not just as individuals, but quite frankly, even as a society, even as institutions. So it's not just me as a white man asking, you know, what was my experience? I tried to walk you through that in that first slide when I said, what brings me to this work? And I just gave you three little formative experiences while there are countless formative experiences that I'm constantly thinking about, how does this show up for me? As somebody who grew up receiving food stamps, when students came to me and said they were hungry, something happened for me. Something happened for me and it influenced how I responded to them. To what extent am I conscious of that? To what extent am I unconscious of that? How we look at race growing up informs how we show up in the class and how we face students across racial difference, et cetera. And so this is the work we need to do. But we also need to do that same work in looking at our institutions and our systems and the history there because we are we are, we, are, uh, we are working in a system and we are cogs in the system. And if we're not clear about what the purpose of education is versus the purpose of schooling, and if we haven't had the discussion or the reflection of why, whether or not there is a difference between education and schooling, th that's part of the work that we need to do. And we need to create those conditions. Some of this work, however, is not just discovering. It's not just um, organically forming definitions on our own. Some of, this, some of this work is based on facts and history that already exist. And, and as difficult as it is for adult learners to, um, to not create their own learning, it's important for us to also, as part of these conditions, about that. From taking some time to understand our stance and schema, because we can't transform to something as um, efficiently as we might want to if we, are, if we don't have an understanding of that which we're transforming from. And so once we create time and space to be in that work and we have begun the work of stance and schema awareness, what we need to do then is we need to create conditions that allow for interruptive or catalytic experiences. Again, as I mentioned, we are 
uh, a profession filled with people, for the most part, who are in here with very, very, very good intentions. And so the idea that um, we're doing something that requires interruption, it's, it's a challenge. We also live in a society where public education has become this bastion of blame for social ills. And so there's not a lot of willingness to take risk. There's not a lot of um, willingness to be vulnerable in a public way. So recalibrating our discourse and recalibrating our way of collaborating so that we are not only being interrupted, but we're welcoming that interruption. We're not just interrupting somebody, but we're sitting with them through the transformation. That's a different scheme. That's a different way of being in public education. That requires a lot of shift in intentional shift in our conditions. We need to take time and really understand what are the norms? What is our vision? Are we, are we attached to that mission? Are we attached to that vision? What does it look like when we prioritize our work and our decisions uh, through a student-centered mission focus versus that which feels comfortable or that which is um, perhaps going to keep our jobs safe, which again, in the society is a rational and reasonable reaction for many in our profession. How, do we understand there's so many words out there that are power words in our society, equity, success, achievement, etc. Have we calibrated what that language means, not just for me, but for you and for each other? And have we decided what it means for our community? I went into a community once where they were trying to uh, agree on norms. And it was really striking to me because one of the things that they said was that um, they were really held up in agreeing on a final set of norms for two months because they could not agree on one norm. And that was whether or not they were going to have the norm of be respectful. And I thought to myself, that's fascinating because I know that many of the students where, where, um, who we serve, they're, feeling, they're like, that's not an option. That's not an option. And so I went into the, the community and I asked a few questions. I said, first of all, what does respect look like? Are we even agreeing on what respect looks like? Because there are things that are respectful to one culture that are completely disrespectful to other cultures. They had not even begun to do that work. And then I finally just asked the question, so if we were to say that, um, if we were to say that we can't agree on this and we don't vote on this, is the norm therefore to be disrespectful? And that was the end of the story. I mean, they, they, they realized that this was just a detour from having hard convers the harder conversation about what does respect look like and feel like if we're not just using a dominant culture lens. So we need, to come, we need to do a lot of work of calibrating who and how we are and how we want to be in order to allow us to be able to do those interruptions. And I also want to say that we also need to practice those interruptions. We need to use protocols and structured conversations not to contain our discourse, but rather to scaffold us to the organic discourse. So we have practice of what it looks like to have equitable or shared space. We need to practice, quite frankly, sentence stems around how we might interrupt somebody or how we might interrupt an inequity when it's happening before us. We need to practice inquiry and using probing questions instead of judgmental statements. That's a lot of the work in creating the conditions for this stage. Once we've created the conditions, we also need to actually make new meaning because the, and I'm moving on to the third stage because it's not just about the interruption as I mentioned. Once we have the interruption, and once inequity is interrupted, we need to take time. We're always in such a rush in our schools. We, we've always got these, these, the, the constraints of time uh, working against us. We need to create time and sacred space for us to make new meaning of our dilemmas, new meaning of our inequities. And what we learned in our work is that that happens not in one way, not in two, there are three explicit spaces at least that are necessary for that new meaning to happen. Some of that is work that I have to do on my own. We all come to this journey in different um, ways and on different uh, paths. We need to create space where there is individualized learning for adults to learn about the inequities and the strategies needed to interrupt those inequities that might not actually, if we, if we had teacher ed programs that assured we had equity-minded educators day one, maybe we wouldn't need to do so much work alone. But the truth of the matter is we're in different places and we need to allow and support individual learning not in a way that slows the community down, however, which is why we also need people working together in affinity. And when we talk about in affinity, while we do focus on race and say race-alike affinity is important in our schools because in our schools, there is a racial, there is a racial opportunity gap for um, students based on how we identify them racially. Um, 
affinity could mean other demographics as well. We just say, when we talk about affinity, we ask, who are the students you're least reaching? And that is an indicator of a place where some of the work in affinity might need to happen. And the reason we do work in affinity is that for some of us, affinity spaces are healing places that we can go, especially for our more marginalized communities, places to go where we can actually be with each other and heal. It's also a place for us to get mentorship for those folks who are further along the journey um, and for those who are newer in the journey, we need places where we can go and have conversations and have mentorship, which quite frankly, those across difference don't need to hear about. Very frequently, I know that my colleagues of color talk about needing to be in community because they need to have a conversation unfiltered so that they can be in community with us. And frequently, I know that my people, white people, we need to be in conversation to, with each other so that we can say the things that we're afraid to say because we might make a mistake, but they're still there and we need to talk about it and we need to move through some of our, our, our work. And our colleagues across different don't need to be part of that and hear that. So we need to do that work in affinity and ultimately our loan work and our affinity work is so that we can come back and if it's without this third step we're missing a critical component so that we can come back and intentionally work across difference and it's in that across difference work that we find some of the richest new meaning making of our inequities that are that are before us and my you know when i think about this as a condition i frequently wonder how many schools are intentional about creating the space for that type of professional development in these three different spaces and only when we create new meaning are we in a place where we can actually make radical change and bold action rather than just tweaking what exists rather than just moving the chairs on the on the titanic and when we talk about making radical change and bold action the truth of the matter is we are stepping out of even just ourselves or our own communities we're talking about this political forces that don't want change to actually happen the status quo serves many 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 people in our community and unconsciously or consciously folks there are folks who do who will push back and react to um, a change towards justice. And so we have to be doing a lot of work in the conditions for radical change and bold action. We have to do a lot of work to, work, um, to, to prepare and partner with our larger political systems. We have to um, literally do a lot of work, even just around how people experience risk and failure, because we have to be able to take risks and not do and not succeed in order to break away from not taking risks but being clear that we're not gonna succeed. So this, this framework, while it may seem like it's oversimplified because it's on one page, results in a continuous and constant cycle of change and work and condition setting and supporting in the communities that are committed to transformation and justice. Um, I wanna just pause for a second. If we could go not to the next slide, but to the slide after that. I wanna step away from all that technical description and just to walk you through an example in my life where I thought about a time when I had an, an ex when I experienced a transformation and I'm oversimplifying it because we know that a lot goes on in our lives to to, to contribute to change and growth etc but I'm hoping you'll be able to just see how by having the conditions um, to go through these cycles shift can happen so the experience I'm, I'm going to just share about is my experience with um, my relationship with black female students. And again, as a white male um, educator, I'm specifically focusing on my black female students. When I was a math teacher, I was um, assigned and focused, as I mentioned to you at the beginning, the classes where students had been traditionally least reached. And these are the, and, and, and as one might imagine, these were uh, uh, in diverse schools, these were classes that were made up disproportionately of students of color. And as a math class, disproportionately also of female students. And so in my classes, I prided myself in having good relationships with my students and we struggled together, et cetera. But it never even, I never even was very conscious about the fact that compared to others in my school, I happened to have successful relationships, positive personal relationships with my black female students. I, it wasn't intention, there weren't, there wasn't in my mind intentional actions for that. It was my way of teaching, their way of learning. It seemed to go well. So I had in my mindset just this an assumption that me, black female students, we hit it off. Then I became a principal. 
And once I became a principal almost overnight, my experience, my day-to-day -day experience with my black female students was radically different. It was radically different. And the thing for me was, again, unexamined, my stance was, but I have positive relationships with my black female students. And I had enough wherewithal to say, this must have to do with me being a principal. And so I just kept my vision on the outside. I was looking out the window and I just was like, oh, this is about them. They have an issue with authority. That's just good to know. And then one day I got a referral for one of my students, a black female student. And I remember speaking to her counselor, her advisor, and I could justify this and simply say, this was my standard MO of working with students. And I said, can you just get me all of her records before I meet? Can I see her previous referrals, her attendance records, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Her, she was being referred for defiance, a senior. And the, the adult looked at me, her advisor looked at me and gave me the most quizzical look as if, she, as if I had three heads and she said, Greg, this is our valedictorian. She has no file. And I remember in that moment, that turned into, while it, she wasn't trying to interrupt me, it was actually a catalytic experience for me. I remember in that moment, something shifted. And I don't know what exactly happened, but in that moment, I was like, oh my gosh, this is me. This isn't about her. This isn't about them. It's me. That regardless of what my previous experiences were, regardless of what my new role was, I had not been in a place yet to examine and look in the mirror and say, there is some implicit bias that I have about black female students and it is playing out and probably playing out even if I have strong relationships with my black female students. And so something shifted and I was like, well, if I've got a bias, I'm not gonna solve this on my own. And so in my new meeting making, I actually wanted to own my work. And I basically went on a listening campaign where I just needed to um, humble myself and just listen, listen, listen across difference. Listen to the wisdom of those who were successful with our black female students, who were black female students, who were the families of black female students, etc. And I wanted to make my, my struggle transparent to hold me accountable. And so I shared with folks that this is what I was struggling with and I wanted to be a learner. I wanted to be a, a, a receptacle and not the leader of that work. I did so much learning in, 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 in seeking out those partnerships and doing readings and that, making that a focus, literally a focus of my own improvement, that my change, my radical change for me was I got to a place where I had to recognize that that bias would never go away, that I would only be able to have um, some level of responsibility of checking it. And so I really created this mantra, and again, I made this mantra public with those close to me, was that I was gonna assume that when I was working with my students across difference, that my bias was playing out. I was gonna assume that. And I created structures and I created reminders for me to check my bias in multiple ways, seeking data, critical friendship, et cetera, whenever I was engaging in a high leverage or high stakes interaction because of my power, my position of power, um, versus the interaction with um, my students across difference. And as a result, over time, by me constantly checking myself and checking my bias, you know, some of that stuff becomes internalized and I feel um, positive about the continued dialogue that happens even now, years and years later. So that's just an example. And if we were to go back to the um, slide before that, you'll see how it's just a blank version of this. And, um, and while we can't be this interactive on a webinar, I, I wanted to still share this because my question with you is just for your own learning and trying to track, again, oversimplifying it into boxes, where's a moment where your schema, where your way of understanding or seeing something shifted and in no way needed, needing to be shifted permanently, but just shifted? What were the conditions that allowed for it? How were you aware of your stance going into this? What allowed for the um, interruption. What was the interruption of the catalytic experience? How did you make new meaning and what changed in your actions as a result of this? So as we move, like I said, for the webinar, we're just going to focus on the two, first two stages in this framework. And again, between now and the next webinar, I encourage you to read the changing the, um, I'm sorry, bridging the gap article. But as we think about this idea of stance and schema awareness, the identity work we need to do about our individual and shared history, just keep in mind, when in your life have, has your own awareness or unawareness of yourself 
in the skin you are in been keenly influential to you and your work? And if we can move on to the next slide. I often remind people just because, just like Laura, uh, Liara mentioned, you know, when we talk about implicit bias, implicit to whom, sometimes because the work we need to do is unknown to us, we think it's unknown to everybody. And students are often the voice that uh, is my check to reality. And I, I, I love this quote from a high school senior where she says, I actually think that it is true that teachers are taught to base, to judge students when they first see them. Let's say they're black or something. Some teachers will kind of be with a cautious approach, watching them and how they act, or some teachers will just judge them and just separate them or something. Next quote, I mean, next slide. So when we think about the stance and schema awareness, again, we're talking about, this is not a one and done, but the, the work of constantly and continuously um, deepening our awareness and knowledge of ourselves, our system, but also of others in our seeking to be allies across difference. What in our schools are we doing? What in our districts and communities are we doing to allow and, and, and sort of uh, lift up that work? We're, and it's important to know that we are doing this work in part to learn and understand that cultural differences are not barriers. We have to flip the script and recognize that our differences are, are not barriers, but actually assets. And so there's an, op there's an operant theory that we need to be able to support. And so we need to create opportunities for us to study, study our identity, study the system's identity, and study our history. And those are two different things. Doing identity work and doing history work, while it's a Venn diagram and they overlap, it's important to know that both of those are important because when we're talking about history, we're not just talking about formative points in history, we're also talking about the cumulative effect of history. When I hear about that was then, this was now, the, um, you know, when people say, well, well, slavery is over, besides the fact that some would argue, no, in many ways it's not, and there's examples of it, there's still the cumulative impact or effect that slavery have, has had, not just on black people in our country, but on our country, on our society. We also wanna constantly be in touch with our current reality. So we need to create systems and opportunity to consistently interrogate uh, both quantitative and qualitative data regularly, but also publicly. We want to share meaning making around what the data is telling us about our community. And another piece of that qualitative data is to be looking at our school design and decisions and ask critical questions. Who does and who does this not benefit? Next slide, please. So one of the pieces of work that we, just to share an example of this work, you've heard me use this terminology, the skin we are in. It's important to understand that when we're talking about the skin we're in, yes, we are talking about race in America, that race is, is unapologetically something that we need to focus on. But it's really all of the formative experiences, and you've heard me scaffolding throughout this conversation, examples of formative experiences. This is just one example of how we might create the opportunity for um, each for each other to explore our culture, explore our identity, and how our experiences consciously or unconsciously might be showing up with us, influencing our actions with our students, both the students who are like us and unlike us. And just as an example, you'll see this little gingerbread person over here, and I um, did some of that work, and I won't go through it in great detail, but I will say, share with you how I, how I use this with my colleagues and with others. Imagine a blank gingerbread, gingerbread person where you're asking yourself, what are those formative experiences and identities? What are the experiences that you just carry with you? What are the identities, the parts of your culture and your identity, uh, how you self-identify that you carry with you? Again, consciously or unconsciously. And this is something you could be reflecting on for a very long time. And what I like to do is I like to use the outline of the gingerbread person to distinguish how I see myself versus how others see me. And so when I, what's on the inside of the gingerbread person, you'll notice some is on the inside and outside very much by design, but what's on the inside of the gingerbread person is what people might not know about me when they first see me, unless they get to know me. But it's still something that's important and influential in how I show up. And on the outside, this is what people might see or might think of me and because it's not just how I see myself that's informed and how I exist in this world and how I react in this world, but how I'm perceived also has a great impact on how I exist in this world. And if we don't think that's true, ask our students. Our students are very 
keen, they're keenly aware of this through their lens of fairness. So what I know is on the outside, I am seen as white and I am white and that affects how I show up every day. I am male, I am married. People know I'm married because they see a ring on my finger or they assume I'm married, etc. Just a, a couple of examples on the inside, but what people don't know, you know, um, especially if we're not talking or engaging, if they just see me and they see the ring, they don't know that I've been married four times. I've been married four times because I got married, my partner and I got married every single time we could. Because for us, it was about politics, it was about social justice, and it was about love. It was about all of that. And so three of our marriages were because the state said we could, as a, a gay couple, get married. One of them had nothing to do with the law, and we had all of the hundreds of people join us and witness it, et cetera. And so there's pieces, and these are very formative experiences because I also identify as both politically and sexually queer. On the inside, and what people wouldn't know because I have a positional power, they wouldn't know that on the inside, I was bullied nearly every single day of my school career. That, that shows up with me, that plays out. Again, there's more here. I use this as an example, and I would ask you to sort of look at that and think about why I might have put that in. And, you know, if this was not a webinar, we'd speak more to it. But similarly, with your, ginger, with your blank gingerbread person, who are you in the skin you are in? What is it that shows up with you, whether you are conscious or unconscious of it, into your work every single day? So if we can go on to the next slide, please. So Liora is going to close out this section. Yeah, we're going to do this briefly because I want to give time to the next stage um, that that is really crucial in this work. But we wanted to offer folks time in the chat box for you to offer when in your life has your own awareness or unawareness, right? Awareness and unawareness of yourself in the skin that you are in been keenly influential to you and your work. And, um, and I, I want to offer that you could also not only include your personal experiences, but you, you could also put in the chat box questions that are coming up for you, right? So how, sometimes I know that I often grapple with like, how, how do I live in what I'm aware, but also put myself in context where what I am unaware of can become something I'm aware of. <laughs> and oftentimes that has to, that only comes from explicitly putting myself as an educator in contexts that are uncomfortable, in context across difference, so that I, the pieces that I might be unaware of suddenly become forefront. Uh, and it doesn't also mean that what I was unaware of was not influencing my work. They were absolutely, right? That's the under the surface influencing the above the surface. So I, I, wanna, I wanna offer for you if you feel willing and comfortable to put in the chat box. Again, if, if not, your personal experience, questions in your practice of what's coming up. Um, that can also serve as, as supporting our dialogue. And Greg, we're gonna move forward. Sounds great. So I'm gonna, uh, the slideshow you all have, I'm actually gonna go through a couple of slides a little bit quickly or just even pass them. Why don't, so for this next one, we're gonna talk about the second stage, about developing community and shared agreements and practices as conditions for interrupting inequities. Um, I'm just gonna push forward to the next slide. And there's a quote here, a very powerful quote, and I just want you to, as I read this, to ask, just be in touch with what's the feeling that comes up for you. We won't report out, I just want you to be in touch with it. And so Chief Joseph said, good words will not give my people good health and stop them from dying. Good words will not get my people a home where they can live in peace and take care of themselves. I am tired of talk that comes to nothing. It makes my heart sick when I remember all the good words and broken promises. The art was talking about the importance of, uh, um, well, not the importance, the importance of us knowing and interrupting dominant discourse. The framework that I went over, the four stages, the interesting thing about that work is that people, when we talk to people, are looking for the curriculum around it, and there's tons of curriculum to support us in it, but it's not a, it's not a book where you go step by step over the course of X number of weeks. The key to all of those stages, the one key to all of those stages is discourse. And what I really appreciate about what Liara was surfacing was that it's not just discourse, but we have to be conscious about what kind of discourse are we talking about? Are we talking about dominant discourse or are we talking about radical discourse? And when I talk about radical discourse, I'm not just talking about blasphemous. I'm actually think going back to the, the, the mathematical word radical, 
the discourse that gets to the root of an issue, the root of the matter. So <clears throat> that discourse, so the, the, the dominant discourse, that's gonna be a lot of talk and not a lot of action. The radical discourse, I actually think what Chief Joseph is doing here is radical discourse, and it doesn't feel good. That's actually a nice sign, quite frankly, that we might be in the, in the right discourse. So if we can go on to the next slide, please. Uh, just very quickly, when we're talking about disrupting our mental models of our identity and our histories, um, we're talking about the importance of developing shared buy-in, community agreements, calibrating expectations, and we have to constantly and continuously deepen and develop our community and trust. We want to practice using equity-centered rituals or protocols, calibrate our language. It's constantly be sh sharing stories across difference. If we don't actually take the time for us to be sharing stories and hearing from each other, we're missing a big piece of that discourse and be in this work constantly and continuously. So if we can go on to the next slide, please. And so <clears throat> um, there's a seminal piece of work by researchers Eubanks, Parrish, and Smith that has really been um, powerful in our work in elevating sort of the difference between that dominant discourse and that radical discourse. And they, they call this discourse one and discourse two. And what they're saying is that the current design and structure of schools are one that are, they are we have discourse one schools. And their suggestion is that we need to be more moving towards the place of having our schools be discourse two schools. Discourse one, they define as the language typically used to talk about question and plan the work of schools change or reform. Discourse one dialogue supports and maintains the status quo without appearing unresponsive to outside demands for improvement. So discourse one is not language that's hurtful or hateful or harmful. Discourse one is that good intentioned language that sounds like we're doing things, but all we're doing is reproducing the same results. While in discourse two, they define that as the language that tends to be about uncomfortable, unequal, ineffective, prejudicial conditions and relationships in schools. And discourse two opens up the space for ambiguity and change to be parts of purposeful structure. In your, you will see a text, the, the, the text we're referring to in your handouts. If not, I'll make sure it's there. But if we could go, just go ahead and go to the next slide. Even after reading this heavy but important text, people frequently are challenged by what does Discourse 1 sound like? What does Discourse 2 sound like? And so we decided to do some, create some tools to help people um, do this. This is not a checklist. This is just meant to be examples. And my question to a community is always, what does Discourse 1 sound like in your community and how can we turn this into Discourse 2? So for example, Discourse 1 deals with the work of adults and sounds like, we can't expect every teacher to know every student's culture. That's reasonable. That's a reasonable thing to hear. It's just not going to lead us to the transformation we need. So well, well, on the other side, discourse two, not as a contra, uh, the, the topics um, go together, the quotes don't. Discourse two deals with the learning and experiences of students. And so like what LGBTQ students have to say about how they're experiencing school and us. So you can see how that's a little bit more ambiguous. It opens up the possibility of really hard work. Discourse one, as another example, deals with systemic and social reproduction or hegemony. It sounds like, look at the parents. The apple does not fall far from the tree. So it might help us to understand what's happening, but it's not a helpful statement at all. While discourse two deals with interruption and transformation and sounds like when a student gets an F who failed, what? I'm sorry, when a student gets an F, who failed what? Who failed whom? And we're trying to flip the script here. Discourse one deals with how adults talk about student learning experiences and sounds like one student should not stop other students from learning. I've heard this a thousand times. Discourse two, on the other hand, deals with how students talk about student learning experiences. Only the black kids get kicked out of her class because we're loud. But that's because we never get help and are bored, so we play around. And so what we're trying to do is one of the most important ways that we can change the conditions so that we are accepting of interruptive experiences and the transformation needed is literally to think about how is it that we talk. So this would be a text that I would strongly encourage people to read. And again, when we think about resources, there's ways of moving deeper into this. So if we can move on to the next one, and I apologize, I'm going very, very quickly here. We're not gonna go into this um, for time purposes, but what I wanna just say is, 
I, we talk about norms as a, as a condition for how we have conversation. I just want to challenge us to think about how our norms explicitly or implicitly um, represent dominant culture. When we talk about being on time, this is about compliance and control. And quite frankly, I don't know other jobs where it has to be a norm that you're striving to be on time versus it's your job. And so really, when we think about norms, we want to talk about things that we should be stretching to, things that be, should be difficult for us to do. It should not be bare minimum expectations or professional expectations, but they should, it, they, the norm should describe how we want to be when we are together working with each other through a social justice and equity lens. And so again, I apologize that we're running out of time, but I've got some examples showing on the left, be on time versus stay engaged, be respectful versus experience discomfort, step up, step back versus pay attention to patterns of participation, and assume best intentions versus speak your truth. So hopefully those are good nuggets to just have you muse over. Now I'll pass it back to Leora. And taking a breath, Greg, because that, <laughs> that was a lot in a short amount of time. And um, for those of you, I just I want to hold everyone, if, if again, if you are interested in more learning, um, our contact information and references and resources are at the end. And, um, and so I want to hold space for that. We're, we're closing stage two with the essential question of asking us to do some deep inquiry around when we have faced an interruption in our own schema and our own way in which we approach ourselves, the skin that we live in, and how we arrive um, at our work and also in our relationships and in, in our worldview, and what allowed for that to happen. And I think you, if you haven't picked up on it by now, uh, one uh, tool, <laughs> a radical tool that we are encouraging us to um, do some adoption of is some, dis some real discourse too, right? That, ra that way in which the interruptions happen are the way in which we decide to check the assumed way that we do be know under the surface to call out and become move that unawareness into awareness so that the over the surface starts to actually become intentional authentic and and um, eventually equitable and with that, I'm going to move to the last slide that offers more questions to bring back to your practice. I know that most of you are um, either in a cubicle, office, car, school, and you've got a lot of things to do this afternoon. And so what we wanted to do is offer you some questions to, um, to marinate in so that you can continue to make meaning of this learning.